This morning, we are back into our God Against All Odds series from the book of Acts. And we're in this wonderful section here in Acts 17 in a message I've entitled, Paul in Athens, Unknown God Discovered. And this will be part one of a two-part mini-series. And before we began recording this message, we watched a clip from the movie, Jesus Revolution. By the way, it's still in the theaters at the time of this message. The movie Jesus Revolu Revolution is a portrait, so it's not like an accurate photograph. It's a portrait of the last large-scale spiritual revival that took place in North America. Between 1969 and 1972, thousands and thousands of people, especially young people, came to faith in Jesus Christ. In fact, 1972 holds the record for the most baptisms in a single year on North American soil in the last 200 years. Incredible. The principal characters in that incredible movement of God's spirit were the following. Chuck Smith. So that's the actual Chuck Smith on the left. He was a pastor in Costa Mesa, California, and he's played in the movie by Kelsey Grammer. And then Lonnie Frisbee, a hippie street preacher, who, again, a very complicated young man who died at a very young age, but used as a vessel, powerfully used by God. He's played by Jonathan Rumi, who plays Jesus in The Chosen. And then Greg Laurie, played by Joel Courtney. And this is modern-day Greg Laurie. And he is a pastor also in California now. And he's spoken in large stadiums, kind of Billy Graham-esque. He's spoken to over 6 million people. I've heard Greg Laurie speak in person before, and a tremendous evangelist. Now, I'm not going to go further into their story and into that particular amazing revival story right now. The reason we watched the clip was because of the poignant insight that it offers through some really great quotes. So here are some of the quotes. Drugs, music, relationships, all a quest for God. We saw Timothy Leary speaking at that concert, and he talked about the psychedelic experience of taking LSD is a confrontation with the divine, a spiritual awakening in which you define God as best you can. We heard the words, searching for all the right things in all the wrong places. And then the other quote that I really appreciate, a, rel a relentless pursuit of the truth, chasing hard after lies. I remember the first time I saw that movie, I've seen it twice, but uh, the first time I thought, the more things change, the more they stay the same. This is where human beings existing up and down the streets of Kitchener-Waterloo live, pursuing things to bring them fulfillment, but it's all a search for God. We think the quest is, is this, but it's actually that. And the Apostle Paul, he knew that story only too well in his own life. Check out his story in Acts chapter 9. Paul was looking in many wrong places for God. And God found him and transformed Paul's heart and life. And as complicated as Paul's past had been, his future was about being on a mission to help others in their quest, in their search for God. Well, we've come to this part of Acts 17 where Paul enters the ancient city of Athens. And we're not going to revisit the places he's been in Acts 17. Please, if, if you missed that, go to the Grace website or the Radiant uh, website and get caught up. But this section of Acts 17 is just so rich with the story and so dense with how to engage our current modern day world, maybe more than any other passage in God's word that we're going to spend two Sundays on it. It's that meaningful. And we're going to discover an evangelistic strategy in this passage. You might want to take notes, especially in week two. By the way, did you know that strategy is not an unspiritual word? 
It, it's truly not. We don't depend on strategy. We depend on God's Spirit. But God's Spirit is the one who led Paul in this carefully plotted strategy of evangelism that we're going to see. Well, to really appreciate the way Paul framed the gospel here, we need to do some pre-work in terms of understanding a few things about the Athenian culture and ours. And that's what Paul the missionary did in spades here in Athens. And that's what we need to do as missionaries here in Kitchener-Waterloo. So first of all, we as Christians, notice on the screen, we have to stop assuming that people have some knowledge of the true God or an understanding of the meaning of sin and the fall because they don't. Many, many people who have immigrated or are refugees from other countries and even most of the people born here in Canada since the 1970s don't know these things. We need to start assuming they don't. This ought to change how we communicate the gospel with people. I want to show you something, and I know many of you have seen this before, but this is Belmont Village Church's discipleship pathway. So if you look at the top there, how does someone in the world, living out there in the Kitchener-Waterloo community, how do they become a disciple of Jesus? That's someone who follows Jesus, is being changed by Jesus, and is committed to the mission of Jesus. How do they become a disciple and become a disciple maker? So this is a bit of a strategic pathway, so to speak. Well, first of all, they need to be reached out to, right? So we reach out through serving events. We reach out individually. We reach out through our missional families. And when we do whole church events, and, and how do we reach out and how do we see people from the community come into our faith community, whether or not they believe in Jesus yet? Well, through bridging events, and I'm going to talk about those in just a moment. But then hopefully, they'll start coming out to our Sunday gatherings like this and get involved in our missional families all throughout the city. And then eventually, to want to be a part of our discipleship villages, because every church on the planet needs to be committed to the mission of Jesus and to disciple making. Not just because it's a great activity, it's because that's our identity as the called children of God, to be missionaries and to be disciple makers. Well, let's think about that middle one there, bridging events. So we talked about what are some bridging events? Well, our missional family potlucks that we do once a month, where we can invite people from the community into those to participate. Our church picnic. Uh, that we have every summer. Now, this summer, we're hoping that we'll have even more neighborhood church picnics, that we'll put some energy into having some of those picnics right in neighborhoods throughout the city and invite people to those. Our Easter breakfast is an opportunity, a bridging event. Our Lenten lunches, wonderful uh, bridging event. Youth events, kids events, etc. So thinking again about bridging events. Now, can I tell you that all through the years, I have learned as much from people younger than I as I hope they have learned from me, and I mean that sincerely. Recently, I was talking with an amazing 34-year-old woman who said this, Dad, <laughs> Dad, I like and I get the term that Belmont Village Church uses in your discipleship pathway called bridging events. May I suggest something for you to think about? And I said, yeah, of course. And so Ruth Ann, our daughter, said, it, it's something that we are thinking about and talking about a lot here in our church in Paris. And by the way, do you want to know what the name of their church is? Sojourn Church. That's where our co-leaders team went to visit about a year and a half ago because they are a church that had merged just a few years before that. And that's where our daughter and our son by marriage have been called to serve just in May of this year. So they've moved to Paris, and our son by marriage is now a pastor at that church. But she went on to say, people in the greater community of KW may not ever see this language of a bridging event, 
But then again, they might. And they might not necessarily appreciate being led across a bridge from where they are to somewhere you may want to take them. I said, point taken, point taken. She went on to say, we've been thinking about a different image. Most of our neighbors, most of your neighbors, wouldn't feel too comfortable walking into our homes, like walking right into our houses. Even if they were invited, they might not take that kind of step. But most would walk up and sit down on our front porch if we invited them to. That's true. We've seen that over and over again in our neighborhood. Come on up, sit on our front porch, and people willingly do that. And I said, I see where you're going with this. Wait a minute. No, I don't. Where are you going with this? I, I wasn't sure where she was going. And she said, okay, if the house represents church, back in the day, people outside the house understood the language being spoken inside the house, even if they didn't regularly visit inside the house. Because back in the day, people in our Canadian culture kind of lived on the front porch. They understood the language. So when Christians talked about Jesus, the Son of God, or about sin and salvation, or about the gospel, people had been exposed to that language for most of their lives. They understood what we were saying. But not anymore. Not anymore. These are foreign words and concepts to them now. So what we're talking about as a church, she said, is how we can work with that imagery of a home and how we can create, notice on the screen, front porch events. I kind of like that. Front porch events that people would maybe actually want to engage in. And I said, that's brilliant. I'm so grateful you took after your mother. <laughs> and Paul, the apostle, understood that. Not the part about me, Ruth Ann being like her mother, okay? Stay with, stay with me, people. Pay attention. Paul understood that when he was in the synagogue, his audience was on the front porch. And they understood the language. So when he talked about a God of creation, they got it. When he talked about the meaning of sin and the fall, they understood it. The reality of God's justice, check, we understand those terms. So Paul then takes them to their long-awaited Messiah and tells them about Jesus, his death, his resurrection. But here in Athens, it's a different story. Paul needs to invite them up onto the front porch and he needs to do so by listening carefully to their culture, to use his mind and to do his homework, to be creative and to be willing to do all of this. Why? For the Lord, for his king, Jesus, and for people who are on a search for God and don't even realize it. Does any of that make sense? This is all framing for where this text is going. Well, feel free to shout it out. Does anyone know what that famous site is in Athens? Still around to this day. Starts with P. Good, very good. Parthenon. It's described as a resplendent marble temple built between 447 and 432 BC during the height of the ancient Greek empire. Dedicated to the Greek goddess Athena, the Parthenon sits high atop a compound of temples on what is known as the Acropolis of Athens. Paul would have seen that. Isn't that amazing? He would have walked through there. He would have walked through and witnessed all these places. This was the home of Plato and Aristotle, whose philosophies shape Western cultural thinking in a big way to this day. Athens was an Ivy League university city and has been for millennia. If you look at this uh, photo here, the, the theater of Dionysus, the Parthenon, the Erechtheum, even Nike was there. Who knew 
the temple Athena Nike was there. And over on the far right at the top is Mars Hill, also known as the Areopagus. Now you see it's sitting apart from the, the Acropolis, but it's very close by. But Paul's not there sightseeing as we would be. He's there for another reason. Check out what Luke writes about that scene in verse 16. While Paul was waiting for them, Silas and Timothy from the previous section, uh, he was, for them in Athens, he was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. Historians say that there may have been as many as 30,000 statue idols representing various deities throughout the city of Athens. And possibly that many idols again located in the Parthenon. Man, when I read that, I thought, wow, the idol manufacturing business was booming. Right? Making idols was the, the thing to do. Busts of Greek gods. Phallic images of fertility gods. Images of birds and sea and land animals and weird-looking non-earth creatures, etc. All over Athens. Notice Paul's response to what he saw. He was greatly distressed. Internally, Paul is, is deeply grieved by idol worship. Why? Well, as he explains in 1 Corinthians, there can be spiritual forces at play behind idols, and there normally were. But you know what? It's no different today, right here in KW. Walk the streets of KW, and you will see a city full of idols. They may not be as physical, but they are just as prevalent. Idols such as jobs and the status that comes with those jobs. Entertainment, the idol of comfort, of technology, of physical appearance. Even the idol of family and of children, of influence and of fame, of sex and sexualization, of identity, of money, material things. I found this list in a blog called Rethink, and it's very good. From Tim Keller, he says this, An idol is anything more important to you than God. Anything that absorbs your heart and imagination more than God. And anything that you seek to give you what only God can give. Does idol worship distress and grieve you? Does it distress and grieve you the way it does Jesus? Because he knows that, that it's a counterfeit of what's real through a relationship with God. It may be acceptable to the entire world, but is it acceptable to God? Well, in verse 17, we're going to see what Paul does in response. Look what it says. So he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, as well as in the marketplace, day by day with those who happen to be there. Where is this audience in that imagery that Ruthann shared? They're on the front porch, right? These are Jews who understand all the terminology. These are God-fearing Greeks. So Paul reasoned with them. Just like strategy, reasoning is not a bad thing. The Athenian culture of debate and sharing ideas in the marketplace was a way for Paul to meet them on the front porch. So notice where he goes, the synagogue, the marketplace, but he's going to be invited to another significant location very shortly. Look at verse 18. A group of Epicurean and Stoic philosophers began to debate with him. Some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say? Um, others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. We like that. <laughs> Another God. They said this because Paul was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. Okay, let's look briefly at these two groups of philosophers here. First of all, Epicureans. Who are they? Well, they formed from a school of thought started by a guy named Epicurus in 300 BC, and it held the following beliefs. They believed in a pantheon of gods and goddesses, but these gods had nothing to do with the real world. They had separated themselves from the real world. 
They believe that Earth, life on Earth, came about as a random collision of particles. Sound familiar? Their theory recycled into the Big Bang Theory. There's nothing new under the sun. They believe that when you die, that's it. Your light goes out with a whimper, and there's no afterlife. And they believe that the chief end of mankind is to be free from pain and to pursue pleasure. Wow. A lot of this sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> Almost as though today's philosophies are simply the old ones revisited. Now, let me say about this pursuit of pleasure. The pursuit of pleasure, however, was not necessarily in a hedonistic way. They pursued the pleasure of a peace-filled life, one free from pain and from superstitious fears, especially the fear of death. So it's kind of a philosophy of enjoy life, avoid pain, because when you die, it's over. <laughs> Sounds like North Americans are actually Epicureans, doesn't it? Very much so. But then the Stoics. The Stoics were formed from a school of thought started by a guy named Zeno. <laughs> thought it was going to be Stoi or something, but it wasn't. It was Zeno. Again, 300 BC that held the following beliefs. They believed in not a pantheon of gods. They believed in pantheism, which identifies God with the universe or the universe as a manifestation of God. In other words, everything is God and God is everything. Okay? Now, this next part is philosophically very different than the Epicureans. They believed that you had to endure all things. Epicureans were about enjoying all things, but the Stoics were about enduring. Stoicism, have you heard that term? Enduring all things. They placed a high value on moral sincerity and duty. The idea being to breed a proud dignity. There's a quote from Stoicism, no life is better than a life lived with dignity. And they believed that nothing should be resisted. So live for yourself. Live for yourself. Again, sounds like North Americans embrace a mixture of Epicureanism and Stoicism. But do you see how this audience had no baseline? No baseline regarding the true God. Or Jesus. Or about sin and salvation. In fact, just... Go with me on this. In fact, I think that Paul might have taken the wrong tact at the beginning with them. Because look at what they say. What is this babbler trying to say? And he seems to be advocating foreign gods. I think it's because Jesus, er, Paul couldn't wait to get to Jesus. I just want to talk about Jesus. And to what does it say? Preaching the good news about Jesus and resurrection. But that's not going to work. Not with this crowd. Paul needs to pivot. And he needs to meet them on the front porch. It's not what he bargained for. But he pivots. Look at verse 19. Then they took him and brought him to a meeting of the Areopagus, where they said to him, may we know what this new teaching is that you're presenting? Now, some of your Bible versions say Mars Hill. And it is the same Greek word. Areopagus is the transliteration of the Greek word. If you look at the Greek word, it looks an awful lot like Areopagus. That's a transliteration. But the Greek interpretation into English is Mars Hill. And here's a picture of it on the screen. That's Mars Hill. And as we saw before, the Areopagus is a rocky outcrop close to the Acropolis in Athens. But this was the political epicenter of Athens. Philosophy met morality, met religion, met politics. In fact, it was more than a place. It was a prestigious council. So they met there someplace in some form with this group. And as Chuck Swindoll, a radio teacher, Bible teacher, says, these eggheads, <laughs> these egghead philosophers wanted to know about Paul's new teaching that he was presenting. And so look at what they say in verse 20. You are bringing some strange things to our ears, and we would like to know what they mean. And then just this kind of humorous aside from Luke, he says, all the Athenians and foreigners who lived there spent their time doing nothing but talking about listening to the latest ideas. Oh, the life 
<laughs> right? This is like a philosopher's discussion society dream come true. Sounds like a university campus, actually. And so verse 22, Paul then stood up in the meeting of the Areopagus and said, people of Athens, and next week, that's where we'll begin with Paul's amazing message to the people of Athens. But may I ask you to do something? This week, you have some homework. Read through and meditate on what Paul said to these people who had never visited the front porch of Christian faith. Not to mention been inside the house of a church. May we experience, as we do that, the heart of the shepherd. The heart of the shepherd who literally saw these people as he sees the people of our city as sheep without a shepherd. And he cared so much for them that he influenced Paul to take a totally different tact with these people and meet them on the front porch. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your ancient word that is more relevant than today's news. God, thank you for speaking to us about the kind of times that we live in right here in Kitchener-Waterloo. God, would you form us through your word and through your spirit so that we might see with your eyes and with your heart the people of this city. God, I pray for anyone here today who by your spirit has, has, has felt that that prompt today that I need the shepherd to lead my life. Jesus, we invite you, the one who died on Good Friday, was buried and rose again on Easter Sunday. We invite you, living Lord and King, to lead our lives, to lead us through all the twists and turns and hills and valleys that we are going through right now and we will go through this week and into the future. We invite you to do that. God, may the result of our time in your word be that others will know him, will come to know him as their Lord and Savior too. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.